Right. We're once again in the book of Judges. We're in chapter five. We're going to begin reading in verse six down to verse 23, although hopefully we may get to the very end of the chapter here. And our title this morning is Post Battle Analysis. And really, that's what is going on here in this chapter. It's uh, retrospective, they're looking back, and it's an analysis of the battle who did what, uh, who got involved, who stayed out of it. Uh, This is what's going on. And it's really a kind of a picture, as we've said earlier, that uh, when our battle is finally over, uh, we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And there will be a post-battle analysis of what we did uh, in this body, uh, in the cause of Christ and the battle uh, for truth. So we'll begin in verse 6. It says, in the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, In the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied and the travelers walked through byways. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. Speak, ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit in judgment and walk by the way. They that are delivered from the noise of archers in the places of drawing water. There shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. Then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. Out of Ephraim, was there a root of them against Amalek after thee? Benjamin among the people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. Then the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak, he was sent on foot into the valley. For the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart, Why abodest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleatings of the flocks? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. Gilead abode beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and abode in his breaches. Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. They took no gain of money. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kishon. O oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. Then were the horse hoofs broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Curse ye Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. Curse ye bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. And again, God always blesses the reading of his word. And aren't we thankful this morning that we have his word in our language and we can have the privilege of studying it together. So as we consider this post-battle analysis, of course, what's different about it than a regular post-battle analysis is that it's written in a poetic form. And we said this is a really a, poet, a poetry that was set to music and a, a song that both Deborah and Barak joined in to sing together. And we mentioned that it begins, of course, with their delight in God in the first five verses and recognizing that he was the one who had won the victory. Uh, Again, we we would say along with that, amen, thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they delight in God who's given the victory. In verses 6 through 11, we said it's distress in Israel. And we want to remind ourselves of the conditions before this battle 
that delivered the nation of Israel? What was it like? And we already looked last time very briefly. Uh, we looked in verse six about the highways were unoccupied. The travelers walked through byways. And the idea was it just wasn't safe to traverse the normal highways uh, because the, they were vulnerable uh, to ambush from the enemy. And so they, they avoided the main highways. And so if they had to go somewhere, they would always take a, a kind of some path, uh, by path or whatever, away from the highways because it, it seems safer to them. And so here are the children of Israel in the land of promise that he had given to them, and they can't even walk on the highways. Such was the bondage that they found themselves in. And then uh, it's elaborated further in verse 7. It says, the inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And so village life came to an end because, remember, villages were unwalled and they, they had no defense. And so the people couldn't live in the villages they left the villages and they went to the cities where they had walls and gates. And so the thought was that, um, that there was a massive displacement of people because of the Canaanite invasion. And of course, if we've been following at all what's going on in the news, we can understand this, right? A lot of displacement of people during conflict. And so the villages were empty. People, people had abandoned their inheritance, their place in the promised land, and they had to flee to the cities because the enemy had literally come in like a flood. And so they just couldn't enjoy their inheritance because of what the enemy had done. And so she says, this was the condition, but then she mentions that lovely word, until. <laughs> It's a great word, isn't it? it you, just interesting to study that word until in the scriptures. And it usually is a bleak situation until. And of course, she says, until I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And God rose up this woman uh, when the men were not really willing to take leadership. God raised up this woman to take a, a role as a leader. And she calls herself a mother in Israel. And it's a beautiful picture uh, because a mother cares deeply uh, for her children. And she, she looked upon the children of Israel as her own. She had a tender care for them. She hated to see them suffer. And she would do anything to prevent them from continuing in their suffering. And it's interesting how we just look for a second at 1 Thessalonians 2. Uh, we'll see that the Apostle Paul kind of even borrows this kind of terminology to talk about genuine shepherd care, what, what that looks like. And he talks about in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 7. He says this. <clears throat> he says, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And, of course, the meaning there is like a nursing mother. And just how she, she wants to give her life, her sustenance, as it were, for the child to, to cause him to flourish and to grow, uh, she, that was the kind of shepherd care that Paul had. They gave of themselves, Paul and the missionary team, poured their lives, uh, their energy into the, the, the people of God so that they would be strengthened. And so here she is, she says, I, Deborah, arose, that I arose a mother in Israel. And by the way, how thankful, thankful we are. We often um, think of godly sisters that have had a profound impact in the life of an assembly. And we often would, would use that terminology. She was a real mother in Israel. You know, in that uh, this sister had a great care for the saints and prayed for them and encouraged them and all the rest of it. And there have been some in our lives. Some of us can perhaps think of certain sisters that just had that kind of uh, took us almost as, the, as if we were their own children and invested in us, encouraged us, prayed for us, did everything they could to strengthen us. And so she says, I arose as a mother in Israel. Verse eight is an interesting verse. It says, they chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear among 40,000 in Israel? Uh, 
See, the children of Israel, if they'd been asked why they had reached such a deplorable state, the majority of them would have pointed a finger at the blame to the Canaanites. Well, uh, we were doing fine, but these Canaanites came and invaded us. But here we find in this analysis of conditions that the reason the Canaanites had come into the land, the reason why the highways were unoccupied, the reason why the villages were empty was because the Israelites themselves had chosen new gods. This is the root cause of their distress. It was, it was the result of their choosing new gods. It was a result of they, their backslidden condition. If they had remained loyal to the Lord, they would not have been under the yoke of the Canaanites. It would have been a different story. And so the real reason for their conditions was not the strength and power of the Canaanites, but it was the Israelites. They were not content to follow the Lord and had been brought, therefore, under divine chastisement, whom the Lord loves, he chastens. We also notice that weapons were scarce in the land. There, it says, there was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear among 40,000 in Israel? And so they were defenseless. The people, you know, the, the, the sword, of course, is for attacking thrusts, but the shield is for defense. And, and they were defenseless, and they were not able to attack the enemy because they didn't have any weapons. They were in a, a terrible condition. How did they get that way? Well, they got that way because of their idolatry. And it was as if they, they lost their ability to fight. They became weakened. And of course, the enemy had come in and, and confiscated their weapons and taken them away. And so this was their terrible condition. Notice it says there was war in the gates. Remember the villagers had fled to the cities because there were walls and gates. They thought they'd escaped the problem, but the problem came right to their door. The enemy now was attacking the cities. He'd even come to storm the gates. And so we find that the conditions were absolutely deplorable. The people were disarmed, they were disloyal to God, and the enemy was coming in, as we've already mentioned, like a flood. And in one sense, isn't it interesting that Deborah, as she gives the analysis, she, she acknowledges fully the ruined state of Israel. And I really believe there has to be honesty in the presence of God about our failure before there can be real lasting change. There must be brokenness before there's blessing. There must be repentance before there's restoration. There has to be an acknowledgement of why we're in the condition we're in. And so there's this honesty. This is why they're in this state. It's not the strength of the enemy. It's, it's the sins of the people. They chose new gods. And this is why they were in their condition. And we might ask the question. In fact, H.L. Rossier, uh, he states this in his uh, very admirable commentary on Judges. He says, was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? No longer were there weapons to combat evil. And then he asked the question. Where now are the weapons? In other words, asking the question of us. What has been done with the sword of the spirit? Are we, are we really using it effectively? Where is the power of the word to resist the false doctrine swarming in the very midst of Christendom? Eating as they do like a canker and trampling in the dust the wondrous name of Christ. And so he would say, what about us? Even the shield of faith, he says, has been cast down to the ground. Evil is in the ascendancy. The people of God are powerless to withstand. And so it's good to ask ourselves about our condition, our state right now. Uh, are, we, are we 
witnessing days where it seems to us that the enemy is coming like a flood and the church seems to be powerless and, and incapable of using effectively its weapons of defense and attack, then we, not, we need to ask the question, what's the root cause? Why are we in the state we're in? And it's a good thing to be honest in the presence of God. It's the problem. We're the problem, right? I mean, it starts right here. We're not what we ought to be. If we were what we should be, it would be a different story. Maybe even in Canada and the U.S. and, and the world at large today would be a different story if the church was loyal to the Lord like it ought to be, knowing how to use our weapons and effectively walking humbly with God in serving him with all our might. It could be a different story. Notice verse 9. He says, my heart is toward the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. So Deborah, as we said, she's the author. And so she's using the, the personal pronoun there, my heart. And what she's saying is she's thrilled that once she got stirred up and Barak got stirred up, then other people got stirred up too. And the governors, uh, they began to offer themselves willingly. And it's an amazing thing. She, she sees this as a cause of great rejoicing. She says, um, they offer themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. In other words, something to praise God for is when God's people voluntarily offer themselves. And it, isn't it wonderful when we see people in a sense, do a Romans 12, 1 and 2. When, when they, they willingly present their bodies to the Lord as living sacrifices and say, Lord, I might not be much, but here I am. I present myself to you. Take me up and do with me whatever you will. And there's rejoicing when people do that. And so she's blessing the Lord, and especially because it's the governors of Israel. They're, they're being the leaders are beginning to lead. They're being in samples to the flock, as it were. Those in leadership roles, the governors of Israel, are volunteering for the battle. And she is rejoicing. And so she says, speak ye that ride on white asses, ye that sit on judgment and walk by the way. And so the white asses, of course, were rare and would have been owned by the wealthy nobles. And so the idea is this. Rich and poor volunteered. Uh, those wealthy merchants, the governors, uh, they volunteered to come uh, to the battle to fight against the enemy. And so she's very, very delighted with these things. And of course, it's wonderful when God's people are eager to be available for his service. It's a wonderful thing. And of course, when we offer ourselves willingly, uh, to him and say, Lord, here I am this day. Just take me up. Do with me whatever you want. I want to be used of you. Verse, verse 11, they that are delivered from the noise of archers in the place of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord, even the righteous acts towards the inhabitants of his villages in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. So as a result of these people getting involved in the battle and ultimately the defeat of the enemy, the situation has changed. But in describing the changed situation, it tells us one of the reasons why the villages were, had been empty. And part of the reasons why the villages were empty was that the villages, uh, unlike today, they didn't have running water in their homes, right? Uh, and the luxuries we're used to, uh, they had to go to the well to draw water. And that was a place where people congregated course, it's an interesting study, the wells of scripture. We, we, we see a lot of interesting things happen at the wells. But uh, so they would go to the wells, they would go there to get water, but they couldn't do that safely because of the noise of the archers. In other words, the enemy would wait for them to go and get water and then would fire their arrows. And so they that are delivered from the noise of the archers. So now this is all past in the place of drawing water, there shall they rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. In other words, the, the everyday village dwellers, 
now had great cause to praise the Lord and to rehearse his righteous acts in judging the enemy, in defeating the enemy, and allowing them the privilege of just a simple thing, going to draw water unmolested without worry or fear. And of course, it says, uh, not only drawing water there, they shall rehearse the rights acts of the Lord, even the rights acts towards the inhabitants of his villages uh, in Israel. Then shall the people of the Lord go down to the gates. And so the idea is that the people of God, uh, they're, they're now rejoicing. Uh, they can visit the cities whenever they want. There's not fear of harassment of the, the highway issues anymore of getting water anymore they're now in a in a renewed position but in the very description of their renewed position it reminds us of the great distress that they were once in and now they have great reason uh, to uh, rehearse the righteous acts of the lord and by the way i think it's a good principle isn't it to to be thankful for being able to do things in our society without fear. Isn't it a wonderful thing we can assemble together without fear? Isn't it a wonderful thing that we can we can go shopping without fear? And as we witness what's happening in places like Ukraine, we can realize what it's like when an enemy comes in and just makes the everyday things very, very difficult. And so we need to be very thankful for the mercies of God that we can do the everyday things. Did you thank the Lord this morning that you have such freedom? You thank the Lord that you're, you're not worried about bombs going off in your neighborhood. Uh, so much to be thankful for. And uh, we should be thankful and, and we should bless the Lord for the, for the liberties that we enjoy and we should use them for his glory and honor, use this freedom for his glory and honor. But certainly we find here, <clears throat> that there's cause to rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord. And of course, there's no greater righteous acts of the Lord than those that took place at Calvary. And isn't it wonderful for us every Lord's Day morning to come together and rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord? Oh, what a wonderful thing it is to speak well of his son and the marvelous work that he did for us on Calvary and the freedom that that brought us into from all kinds of bondage and oh, how we should be quick to rehearse the righteous acts of the Lord and, and bless his name for what he has done. Bless ye the Lord. And so great praise because of what God has done. Well, verse 12, she's telling us what really brought about this change. And the, the change that occurred in the nation first began in Deborah. Notice this, awake, awake, Deborah. Awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak, arise, Barak, and lead thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinoam. And so the section begins with a call to Deborah herself to awake. Now, normally, when, when you see this wake up, wake up, it's a plea to take action. It's a, a plea to break out of your complacency and your inactivity and to get involved right it's wake it's time to wake up time to get involved and it's amazing how this wake up call is found over and over again in the word of god and i want to just look at some examples and sometimes this wake up call is actually addressed to god and i want you just to see a couple of these examples and uh, very very fascinating to me to think about this uh, telling god to wake up so psalm 44 verse 23 is the first one I'd like to look at. It says, Awake, why sleepest thou, O Lord? Arise, cast us not off forever. And so it's almost like there, the psalmist is saying, Lord, stir yourself, uh, come to our aid. It seems as if uh, you're sleeping. It seems as if you're indifferent to our our sad condition, our plight, and it's a call to God to awake. Look at Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. In verse 9, again, awake, awake, put on strength, 
O arm of the Lord, awake. And again, God's mighty right arm has often been used as a symbol of his great deliverance. And it's almost like his arm is inactive. It's not, it's not you know, it's resting. And so the, again, uh, Isaiah, uh, the prophet says, awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. In other words, come to our aid as in the ancient days, in the generations of old, when you used to go and fight for us in the battles of the past. And he uses different illustrations of that. And so the first thing is a, a cry to, to God to wake up. <laughs> now, of course, we know that God the God of Israel never slumbers or sleeps, but sometimes it almost seems as if he's asleep and his people are crying to him, wake up, Lord, come to our aid, bear your mighty right arm on our behalf, come to the field of battle, O Lord. And apparently Deborah had to be aroused from some complacency as a judge in southern Ephraim. And so God commissions Deborah. And it is high time, I think, for us Christians to wake up. And I want you to look at the New Testament and just notice a few references to this call to wake up. Romans 13 is a very fascinating little section because it's written to a people who are very knowledgeable. They've just, if they've been paying attention, have just heard the most wonderful exposition of the gospel found anywhere on the pages of scripture in the epistle to the Romans. They, they've learned about the life of crucifixion, being crucified with Christ. They've, they've been challenged to present their bodies a living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to God. And yet, even after all that, he, he's still on to them to wake up <laughs> because you can have everything right, your theology correct, uh, you know, your life in a certain measure of order, and yet be sleepy in the battle. And so in chapter 13, 11, he says, and that knowing the time, boy, that's important, isn't it? Do we know the time? I mean, surely, if, I mean, there was the opportunity for us to wake up and stir ourselves is running out because we're coming fastly to the end of the age. And so he says, knowing the time that now it's high time, it's the right time, it's the, the opportune moment to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, so on and so forth. And what he's saying is you can have all the theology correct. You can dot your I's and cross your T's, but you can be asleep with the truth. And it's time to wake up. And we need to wake up. Uh, look at another couple of quick references, please, and then we'll press on with our passage here. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 34. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, we read these very stirring words. And it's an, it, here it's a wake-up call to, to, to evangelism, to, to gospel work. Awake to righteousness and sin not. And we're going to see in this passage that one of the great sins in, in chapter 5 of Judges that is being brought before us in the post-battle analysis is the sin of omission. And so he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, isn't that a challenging? All around us are people who don't have the knowledge of God. They don't know the truth. And so he tells us, stop sinning <laughs> by, by being indifferent, uh, by keeping this message to yourself, by feasting in the tent when all around you people are starving for want of some crumbs. And so he stirs us to awake. So back again in our passage in Judges in chapter 5, there, there's a need First of all, Deborah is woken out of her own lethargy, and then she 
once you're awoken, you challenge others to wake up. And so she challenges Barak now. And so uh, she, she says, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song, arise, Barak. Okay, so Barak, come on now. God's called you. Uh, he's, he's told you that he wants you to lead the battle. Get involved. Uh, stir yourself, Barak. Uh, go and take captivity captive. And so, Barak, let thy captivity captive, thou son of Abinuin. Now, this is an interesting thing, because we're very familiar with this phrase, leading captivity captive. Uh, we know it from several places. In fact, we might say that, you know, the, the pictures of Christ throughout the scriptures, uh, these types of Christ. And in this instance, Barak is a type of Christ. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. And so, first of all, I want you to go to Psalm 68. I want to think about Barak as a type of Christ and what, what that actually means and what it looks like. Psalm 68 and verse 18, <clears throat> it says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord God might dwell among them. Okay. Interestingly enough, before it, it says the chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them, as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou was ascended on high, thou was led captivity captive. So it's mentioned in Psalm 68, which is indeed a messianic psalm. Thou was ascended on high, thou was led captivity captive, received gifts of men. Now look at Ephesians. And I know this is where you're. Your mind is taking you anyway, but let's just go look at Ephesians in chapter 4. Ephesians 4 in verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Then verse 9, just notice verse 9. Now that he ascended... What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, so on and so forth. So I want you to get the picture here. Why, in what sense is Barak a picture, a foreshadowing of Christ? Well, Remember that Barak had gathered 10,000 men, and they were on Mount Tabor. And while ever they were up on Mount Tabor, the 900 chariots of Sisera couldn't harm them because the chariots just couldn't get up the steep mountain. So while ever Barak's up there, he's just fine. He's really comfortable. Enemy can't put his finger on him. Uh, nothing can happen. But the people of God are still in bondage. Right there, the highways are empty. the The villages are, are are deserted, and so well, as long as he stays there, he's comfortable. But the people are suffering, and so he first has to descend to in you know, to engage the enemy, and that's exactly the same as the Lord Jesus. While ever he was the eternal Son who was ever living in the bosom of the Father, the enemy could never lay a finger on the Lord Jesus. He was safe up there. But down here, people were in absolute abject bondage. And so he had to descend in order to defeat the enemy and bring liberty and freedom to the people. And so in that sense, Barak is a wonderful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. While on the mount, he's safe. But when he descends, he has to enter into the battle. And aren't we thankful that the Lord Jesus left his father's side, left that place where he was the object of angelic worship, where everything was comfortable? And yet down here, there was bondage. The enemy had come in like a flood. People were in dire conditions. And so he willingly left that lofty place and he descended. And he descended to defeat the enemy. 
and to set us free. And so how thankful we are for that marvelous descent of the Lord Jesus. And of course, the one that descended is the one that now has ascended far above all. Uh, every principality and power, every name that was named, he's in that place of highest honor. And so, of course, the enemy was carried away captive. And of course, he spoiled principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2 verse 15. And so how thankful we are for our barrack, as it were, that descended and entered the battle and won the victory. And so what a wonderful picture that is and good for us to be reminded this morning. So it says in verse 13, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. And so, of course, basically, Barak ended up having dominion over the enemies, just like the Lord Jesus has dominion over them and is the ultimate ruler. So verse 14, out of Ephraim, there was a root of them against Amalek. After thee, Benjamin, among the people, out of Machir came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handle the pen of the writer. So now what we're going to see is we're going to get an insight. Remember this post-battle analysis, an insight into the behavior of the various tribes. How did they respond in the day of battle? Of course, all Israel were responsible for their collective defense. And of course, every believer is responsible for fulfilling the Great Commission. We're all to be involved in some way or another. And yet what we see here is that only a remnant participated. We're going to get six tribes mentioned in this early section, then another tribe, Naphtali, later on seven in total. Seven tribes are going to be involved in the battle, which means that five tribes were AWOL, absent without leave. They did not come to the aid of the Lord in the day of battle. And so we're going to look at them all and notice what went on. Notice it tells us, um, as it lists these various tribes uh, out of Ephraim, uh, and then Benjamin, and then Machir. Now, of course, Machir is not a tribe, but when we look at uh, Numbers 26, verse 29, we'll see Machir uh, was a son of Manasseh. And so this is the tribe of Manasseh that are helping out, the half-tribe of Manasseh, whatever. And so Benjamin um, and, and Manasseh are involved in the battle. And then it says, uh, they came down governors, and out of Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. Now, I want to just think about those from Zebulun, they that handled the pen of the writer. And the, the, the idea of the word here is, is that of a recorder or a scorer, and it's used in a military sense. And it denotes the officer who kept the muster roll. And so basically, as they all came to battle, uh, particularly, we read that Zebulun kind of recorded all those that volunteered for the battle. In other words, it was all recorded in a book. I want to just think about that. I think some of you may have seen this, uh, maybe on the internet, or uh, that in the current situation in Ukraine, there's not only the people themselves uh, volunteering to fight, uh, but there's also even foreigners volunteering to fight. And there are people that are keeping a, a muster roll of those that are volunteering to fight in this battle. And so there's a muster roll being kept by Zebulun. And again, just to remind ourselves that when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord keeps perfect records. And he is recording those that willingly offer themselves in our day to fight the wars of the Lord that are involved in the battles, and he's recording it for us very faithfully. And so this is the idea of those that handle the, the pen of the writer. Verse 15, and the princes of Issachar were with Deborah, even Issachar, and also Barak. He was sent on foot into the valley. Now, I want to just think about this. We mentioned that Barak is in Hebrews 11. And part of the reason he's in Hebrews 11 is because of his great act of faith. 
because he did come down Mount Tabor. He did come down on foot into the valley against 900 chariots of iron. And, and he, he, he only had the promise that the Lord had gone before and the Lord would win the battle. But he hadn't seen any evidence. It hadn't rained yet. The flash flooding hadn't occurred yet. When he begins that descent, the enemy is there in all his strength. And so it's letting us know this man is really acting in faith. Again, you remember there's there's hardly any weapons amongst the children of Israel, hardly a sword and a shield among 40,000. And so he is basically running down into the battle, and he doesn't have any weapons uh, to his at his disposal other than the fact that he has the simple promise that God will go for, before him in the battle and that God has given him the victory. And he believes the promises of God running down into the conflict. And this is why uh, we need to recognize this man deserves to be in Hebrews 11, despite his hesitancy, despite wanting Deborah to hold his hand. Nevertheless, he did a wonderful thing. And so it says he was sent and foot into the valley. Then it talks about another tribe, Reuben. And this is very challenging. This is... It says, for the divisions of Reuben, there were great thoughts of heart. Why abordest thou among the sheepfolds to hear the bleating of the flock? For the divisions of Reuben, there were great searchings of heart. And so as we, we think of Reuben, um, they were they had great thoughts about joining in. And they were... They were mulling it over, and they were considering it, but they never, ever did a thing. <laughs> they were crippled into an inactivity by the paralysis of analysis. That's exactly what's going on. They're, they're thinking. They're thinking about it. Uh, should I go or should I not? And, and we're like that. So oftentimes we're, we're crippled by the paralysis of analysis. Should I witness to him or should I not? Should I go there or should I not? Should I be kind to that person or should I not? We find ourselves becoming very introspective like Reuben. And we end up doing nothing. Reuben debated long. And he debated so long that he missed the entire battle. Could that happen to us? Could it happen that while we're wondering what we should do, that the trumpet sounds, the battle's over, and we've missed our opportunity? Ephraim, Benjamin, Manasseh, Zebulun, Issachar, they, they just got involved. They got engaged, and they saw the Lord do a wonderful thing. And, you know, it's you do see God do things when you put yourself out and give yourself to the battle. That's when you see the Lord do things. On the other hand, Reuben, he's still thinking, <laughs> and it's too late. Oh, why did Reuben abide by the sheepfold while the great conflict waged? And why do so many of us, loving ease and comfort, abide in the safety of the sheepfold? when God's glorious gospel is going forth and is opposed by all the power and ingenuity of Satan. <clears throat> the Reubenites had great thoughts of heart. They really agonized over it, but in the final analysis, they did nothing. No sense of responsibility. They were enthused about their own peace and comfort. God said back in Genesis 49, they were unstable as water. And he, God views the sin of omission as a serious, serious sin. We often think of sins of commission, but here there's a sin of omission. He didn't go to the battle. <clears throat> Israel were, as we've seen, in great distress they were in bondage. They needed deliverance. 
the Lord was ready to move, but they were not ready to be part, to join in with the battle. They didn't want their lifestyle to be changed. They didn't want to be disturbed. And so they stayed home and did nothing. And of course, it's comfortable at home. You don't get the smell of the battle. You don't get the heat of the battle. You don't get the, uh, the danger of the battle. And so it's a nice place to stay. And so they, they thought about it and they did nothing. But then there are others that didn't even think about it. It says, Gilead aboard beyond Jordan. And why did Dan remain in ships? Asher continued on the seashore and aboard in his breaches. And so at least, at least Reuben thought about it and did nothing. It seems that these other tribes, it was all too far and too distant from them. And so they didn't bother even thinking about it. The tribe of Dan, obviously, this is early on. They haven't gone up north yet. They're still on the coast. They're still by what's known as Joppa. Dan was supposed to be the missionary tribe. Uh, that's what they were supposed to be. Joppa was the port where they, they were supposed to go from there and be lights to the nations. But they, they didn't even stir themselves to uh, move into the conflict. They just, well, they just stayed where they were. They remained in ships. They were involved in mercantile activity. And uh, they were just content to do that. Gilead, again, stayed where they were, didn't even give service a second thought. Asher, well, they, they were on the beaches. They continued on the seashore and aboard in his breaches. They just, well, maybe they were getting a, working on a suntan on the beach and they didn't want to get too involved either. And, of course, it's kind of a mirror of contemporary Christianity. Uh, many don't give the Lord's work a second thought taken up with their business, mercantile, in ships, their leisure, just walking on the beaches, whatever. And meanwhile, the battle rages and millions are still in bondage. And the people that have the message and have the answer that can do something, well, they're just too busy. And so it says, they remained in ships. On the other hand, Zebulun and Naphtali were a people that jeoparded their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. And again, what a contrast. Some not even stirred, not even budging out of their place, while others jeoparded their lives in the high places of the field, right in the midst of the battle. And it isn't interesting. We, we, we've often sung that hymn, Must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sailed through bloody seas. And again, we just see here, this is what's going on here. There, there's many that are just, well, they've just got lots of excuses. Man is full of excuses for not being involved. It says the kings came and fought, verse 19. Then fought the kings of Canaan. In Tanakh, by the waters of Megiddo, they took no gain of money. Usually, when these Canaanites came a raiding, they took plunder with them. They took money. They took, later on we're going to see, they took maidens with them as part of their prize. They took clothing. They took raiment. And here we, we read that on this occasion, they got nothing. And the reason was that God's people stood up and fought, and they, they went to the battle, these seven tribes that fought. And as they did, God fought with them. It says, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon, oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. So the picture is this. They went to battle, and they risked their lives. Here, here's Barak running down barefoot into battle without weapons. And yet he saw the Lord fight from heaven. He saw the Lord bring this, this, this storm and this flash flood. And suddenly all of the, the, the might of the military uh, technology of the Canaanites was ground to a, a halt. 
And they witnessed that. They witnessed the Lord fight for his people. They witnessed the Lord do great things. And how much do we miss when we avoid the conflict, when we stay out of the battle? How much do we miss of seeing God work in wonderful ways? And so he, the, the ones that went to battle, they, they saw the Lord do these things. Verse 22, it talks about now not the distress of of the people of Israel, but the distress of the Canaanites. Then were their horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And so as this flash flood came, the horses panicked as the, the waters came and they're, they're prancing. And it's very descriptive, the chaos, basically, of the Canaanite military being brought to their knees because God fought for Israel. And then we come to verse 23, Kirshi Miraz, said the angel of the Lord. We haven't seen the angel of the Lord since chapter two, but he's here again. This is, remember, a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus. Kirshi Miraz said the angel of the Lord, Kirshi bitterly the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Miraz was strategically located to cut off the retreat of the enemy in the day of battle. And they didn't do anything. They were guilty of a great sin of omission. They were in a strategic spot where God could have used them mightily. And they didn't. And so the Son of God says, curse ye Miraz. The amazing thing is, you never hear of Miraz again in the entire word of God. They're gone. And what a serious thing to have the angel of the Lord put a curse on someone. Now, again, we know that as believers, we'll never be cursed. <laughs> it's impossible. But we do know this, that one day we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus. Every one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to give an account. There's going to be a post-battle analysis of our service to the Lord. And I think just one look from his eyes, he, don't ha he won't have to say too much. And we'll realize we missed glorious opportunities. And we'll sense that. <laughs> we'll sense that we should, have, we should have been more engaged. But the good news is, this is the first day of the rest of our lives. Can't do a thing about yesterday. But I can offer myself willingly today for the battles of the Lord. May God encourage us with these thoughts. Amen.